June 12, 2024, the 20th anniversary of the Mulvane, Kansas tornadoes back in 2004. You've probably seen some of these pictures from Jason Pollitt, Scott Karenz, the late Eric Nguyen, and uh, Scott Blair as well. Anyway, we are coming up on the solstice in about a week. That's going to be on June 20th. And the National Hurricane Center maps starting to look a little bit more active. A couple of areas of concern, one over Florida in the Atlantic and the other in the Bay of Campeche. Anyway, we'll check back in on this over the next week or two. Let's take a look at the surface map around the country. We've got a large ridge extending from New York down to Tennessee, Mississippi, and Louisiana. This is a zone of, you, you can see by the dew points there, that's of Canadian origin. Dew points are in the 50s and lower 60s. So that air came down from the prairies in Ontario. It's in the process of modifying over the relatively warm and moist terrain. So that's going to acquire tropical characteristics. Down in Florida, we've got a bit of an atmospheric river crossing the state. Massive rains going on in Miami this afternoon. And you can see what looks like a little bow echo right there crossing east to west through the metro area. That might be a little bit south of there, actually, around Homestead. But that is heading out to sea. So probably we're going to see a little bit of improvement in the weather there going into this evening. Also some problem spots up there in Minnesota. We've got our frontal system located in the northern part of the state. Cold front extending southwestward, but even right behind the cold front, quite warm. 97 at Fargo, 96 at Aberdeen, and ahead of it, lots of moisture dew points up into the mid and upper 60s. And we do have severe weather in this area, enhanced risk from the Storm Prediction Center, and a severe watch box. The risks there in northern Minnesota mostly going to be hail and wind, but there could be a few scattered reports of tornadoes. The radar out of Duluth does show discrete modes. In other words, these cells are relatively isolated. There's this one up here in the arrowhead out there by itself. Looks a little bit supercellular. You can see the gradients there on the south side of the storm near that updraft region. And going further down into the populated areas around Grand Rapids, a little bit more clustering, but they do have that triangular shape. Sharp gradients as well on the south and west side, but you do get an idea of the character here. These certainly have the appearance of hailstorms. Maximum estimated hail size showing that purple there, indicating possibly over two inches. Focusing on the northeastern U.S., the ridge position extending from New York down the Appalachian. So this is all going to be high pressure on the eastern periphery. This is cold advection. So we're seeing a little bit of elevated cumulus and even a few showers up there around Maine and New England. Most of the activity is in New Brunswick, and they have some severe watches in effect from the Canadian Weather Service around Moncton. That's a little bit further south in this area right here. And uh, I think, uh, what was it, Ramouski? Yeah, Ramouski in Quebec. There was also a severe thunderstorm watch in effect for that region. In the southeastern U.S., a couple of things going on. One, it appears there might be a little upper level low right there. You can see the spiraling of the cloud field right there over Alabama and Georgia. The other is this atmospheric river coming in from the Gulf of Mexico and the Yucatan. Here's a new map that I have. This is the integrated vapor transport. This is a good product for showing atmospheric rivers. So 7 a.m. this morning, showing that axis right there over southern Florida. And as we go into tonight and into tomorrow, it gradually pushes off to the east. And as far as that upper level low, we don't really see it all that well at 500 millibars. Just a general troughiness right in here, maybe some convergence across Alabama. As we go further to the west, though, upper level ridge across New Mexico. And they do have heat advisories and excessive heat warnings in effect. 
And then we go further to the west and we pick up an upper level low off the coast of Southern California, not close enough to have much influence, although it is given a deep southerly fetch from the Gulf of California into the desert southwest. We go to 700 millibars, about 10,000 feet, and there we do see some evidence of low pressure across northeastern Mississippi. You can see that cyclonic turning of the wind field. Moving into the southern plains, a few showers and thunderstorms down in the Texas Gulf Coast, producing a little bit of a bubble high across the Victoria area. The newer cells heading out to sea towards the southeast right there. Not very much moisture in place just yet. As we go further to the west, hot conditions in the El Paso area, excessive heat warning due to temperatures up to 104 to 108. And then we head into the northern plains. There's that enhanced risk from the Storm Prediction Center. Storms going up from the arrowhead of Minnesota all the way down towards northeastern South Dakota. A very unstable air mass in place across Minnesota. Temperatures well into the 80s with dew points in the mid-60s. This is probably going to be the moisture axis. So that's helping to feed that cluster of cells up there north of Brainerd. And we do have a tornado warning on this cell in Ely, Minnesota. And here we can see that storm up there near Ely, Minnesota, tracking pretty much east-southeast, developing this hook. That's at a pretty far range from the radar site. But uh, yeah, just very marginal rotation in that, yeah, it looked a little bit better earlier. So that's definitely a borderline tornadic cell. And at this moment, it still continues to be tornado warned. What do the roads in that area look like? Well, I wonder if anybody's out there trying to chase. There's got to be a couple chasers in that area. But yeah, this is it. A little bit of traffic. That's interesting. Anyway, you would be looking off into the trees here. So certainly some restricted visibility. That would be certainly a problem trying to chase in Minnesota. Not much to see in the southwestern U.S., so this is a good time to add the station plots. We do see a little bit of weather around Roswell, a few storms that launched over the Sacramento Mountains, now heading out into the prairies. A few other cells around Clayton, and quite a bit of activity in the Rockies over the higher terrain. But one thing that you can see on here, I don't know if you can actually read the uh, screen, but some very hot temperatures. We're up to 106 at Phoenix. 106 at Tucson, 102 at El Paso, and 109 at Las Vegas. And it's just as bad as you go north. Temperatures well into the 90s. We've got 95 there at uh, Winnemucca and 97 at Salt Lake City. 101 at Grand Junction. So quite a bit of heat all through the southwestern region. And that southerly flow coming in from the Gulf of California, not doing very much. This might be a little bit easier to read. This is uh, current data, a little bit newer than that uh, satellite imagery, but we're up to 109 at Phoenix. And one thing that you might notice on here, a conspicuous absence of moisture. Look at those dew points across Arizona. Try to rem remember this when we get into July and August, because we're going to see a big change. These teens and 20s, those are going to go up into the 40s and 50s and maybe even the 60s. That's a sign that the southwest monsoon is in full force. But right now, that is not the case. This is early summer type weather. Dew points quite dry. 28, let's see, we even got 16 there at Phoenix. That is bone dry. So we're going to watch this over the coming weeks and look for the arrival of the monsoon. Also, some crazy heat down there in Mexico. 118 at Hermosillo. Yeah, that's uh, 10 degrees hotter than Tucson, which is baking at 108. And quite a bit of heat as you go further south, although, yeah, it looks like it tapers off into the plateau regions. The heat was much worse a couple weeks ago. Looks like we're now down into the 80s across that region, but even here, not much sign of the monsoon. 
dew points in the 40s, and we don't really find any 50s and 60s except right down here and along the Gulf of Mexico coast. I took a quick check of the climate for Hermosillo to see if we broke a record. Apparently not. They've seen it as high as 121 degrees. Well, that's, that's just awful. I don't know how they can stand the heat, but uh, yeah, we came within three degrees of that with the weather observations for today. And we've also got heat advisories as well through the San Joaquin Valley, focusing on Fresno and Bakersfield. And we've also got excessive heat warnings in the northern part of the valley from Yuba City to Chico and Redding, temperatures up to 106 there. But as we head further north, some cooler air starting to infiltrate the interior. That's going to continue through the weekend. And you can see that we go from 97 at Salt Lake City, 95 at Wendover, and we start picking up this northwesterly flow in the Snake River Valley of Idaho, down to 85 at Boise, 70s in the Willamette Valley, down to 72 at Portland, and a very pleasant 79 degrees at Yakima. This is usually a desert, an inland desert in Washington, very hot temperatures this time of year. In fact, 2021, remember we had 121 degrees up there in British Columbia and near 120 or something like that around Portland. Nothing like that this year. So that is definitely good news for that part of the country. 65 at Seattle this afternoon. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is the extent of this North Pacific High extending inland and providing this northerly component into the Pacific Northwest. And also a thermal gradient. If you look at the red lines, the red dash lines, that outlines a thermal gradient. So we've got cooler air throughout a large depth of the troposphere off the coast of British Columbia into the interior. And that's just going to continue feeding into the northwestern states over the next few days. Heading up north into Alaska, some very pleasant conditions there as well, although a little bit of shower activity in the Alaska range. Temperatures very warm in the Brooks Range, 70 degrees at Anaktuvik Pass and 76 at Ambler. But up to the north, along the north slope, still continued cold due to that northerly component off the Beaufort Sea. Continued cold in the Canadian interior, the Canadian Arctic. Temperatures in the 30s there, so they've not really seen much of a warm-up. But we do have 50s at Banks Island. Cooler weather around Baffin Island. This represents a large chunk of polar air. And of course, where is that going to go? Well, that's going to head south into Hudson Bay and the prairies. Temperatures there, quite pleasant, 50s and 60s. And that's helping to regenerate some of that cold air north of that frontal boundary. And you can see much warmer air down to the south. In the Maritimes, temperatures in the 70s for the most part, some of that warm air feeding all the way up into Quebec. I probably could have drawn a frontal system up through here, dividing these upper 70s from the cooler conditions up to the north. And we take a look at the jet stream patterns, and we see a large area of troughing in the Gulf of Alaska. That's co-located with that cold air mass that is affecting the northwestern states. Very broad and deep cold air mass helping to lower the heights in that region. And we've got the polar front jet flowing around the south side of that. Into Montana, we've got winds almost 100 knots west to east, and then it kind of branches off one southern stream across the Maritimes and another one into James Bay and into Baffin Island. That's probably linked up with that warm front that I was talking about across Quebec. And then we find that cutoff low off of California. That's not really doing much right now. A little bit of enhanced flow coming up from the south, but it still remains hot over the southwestern deserts. So let's go ahead and take a look at the weather over the next week. There's our frontal system up there in the northern plains into the northwestern U.S., cooler air across the northwestern half of the country. And as that frontal system sinks southwest overnight and into tomorrow, there's going to be a chance of severe weather in parts of southeastern Iowa, northern Missouri, and western Illinois. The main risks, wind and hail. Very 
slight decrease in the heat in the southwestern deserts. Maybe now we're starting to get some effects from that southerly flow, and that will be bumping the heat up further north. We're going to be seeing 101 degrees at Grand Junction, 101 at Pueblo, 99 at Salt Lake City, and 93 at Boise. Also heating up in the Central Plains, we're going to be looking at 90s across much of western Kansas, up to 103 at actually at Dodge City, 101 at Amarillo, and 100 at Wichita. And with that very strong heating and upslope flow, probably some strong storms around Goodland up to Burlington and Lyman. So maybe some chasers will be out there trying to catch some of that action. As we go into Friday, that cold front continues sinking south through the Great Plains. We're going to be seeing a slight risk in central Nebraska due to that upslope flow. There it is coming together, supporting this uh, MCS coming out of Colorado, probably tracking right there along that warm front. Also a slight risk for the northeastern corridor right through here along that frontal system. And as we go into the overnight hours in Nebraska Friday night, you can see that system pushing right through the state. Okay, going into Saturday, we will be seeing some 100s popping up in Georgia, looking for 101 at Macon and 100 at Augusta. Meanwhile, much colder air coming into the northwestern states, looking for 62 at Seattle and 67 at Portland. 60s and 70s for highs across the northwestern states. Going into Sunday, a big warm-up in the Midwest, especially in the Corn Belt area. We're going to be seeing temperatures around 93 at Chicago, 92 at Indianapolis, also mid to upper 90s in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. Meanwhile, cold air continues filtering southeastward from the northwest. Highs will be 74 at Boise, 65 at Spokane, and 62 at Great Falls. Then on Monday, you're going to see this tropical moisture work into the western Gulf. Big slug of moisture coming into New Orleans, Houston, and Corpus Christi. Well, the models have not really been all that accurate with details in the Gulf beyond five days. So we do take this with a grain of salt. But what does it show for Monday? There it is. 2 to 2.5 inch precipitable water coming up into East Texas and Louisiana. And some of it right up there into the Mississippi River Valley. So any source of lift, dynamic lift, boundaries, that could be a focus for convective development. That'll persist through Tuesday and on into Wednesday. And gradually, a lot of it starts pushing west into the Mexican interior. So five days out, I don't think we can be totally sure where that rain's going to be. But we know somewhere between Georgia, Kentucky, all the way back towards Kansas and Texas, this could be an area for heavy precipitation, especially with this front up to the north. And you can see as we go into Tuesday and Wednesday, that cold front heads right into that moisture axis. So I do think we're looking at some potential for heavy precipitation somewhere in the central part of the country. A quick update in Minnesota. We've still got a tornado warning on that cell, 70 miles away from Ely, already heading towards Lake Superior, about to hit the coast there. Other cells across the central part of the state, this one has a tornado warning on it. That's going to be near Cross Lake. Other cells further down the boundary kind of tapers off south of the interstate. So that wraps up our Wednesday edition. Hope you enjoyed the show. And if you have any suggestions or comments, please post. I would like to see what you have to say. All right, we will see you back here on Friday for another edition. Take care and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.